This is Darren Brown. He's an illusionist, mentalist, and overall creepy guy. You always get the feeling there's something ever so slightly off about him. He's peculiar. Anyway, since his TV debut in the year 2000, Darren has been producing increasingly outlandish and extreme illusions as part of TV specials. These shows usually feature him performing mystifying acts like playing Russian roulette live on television, performing a seance, brainwashing supposedly real people to rob a bank, or predicting the lottery numbers. Darren presents these things as though they're completely genuine and legitimate, and it seems like a fair amount of the audience believes that all these things are real too. But as your reputation grows and the expectation of your tricks becomes increasingly high, you're going to have to make your next special something even bigger. Something so outlandish, so crazy, that it might just be one of the most ridiculous things to ever be broadcast on television. Welcome to Apocalypse. Over the next two one-hour episodes, I'm going to give one unsuspecting person a second chance at life. By creating the end of the world, I hope to make him recognise the value of what he has. In short, Darren is going to recreate the end of the world so that a participant learns to value his life and the people around him. Is that a bit overkill? Maybe. To find the right candidate, the crew apparently scoured through over 8,000 replies of people who applied to be on an unspecified Darren Brown show, of which hundreds went through psychological tests and interviews to find the right guy. He's apparently someone that is particularly suited to this project, whatever that's supposed to mean, robust enough for whatever lies ahead, and suggestible to being hypnotised and put to sleep. Yeah, we're going that direction. 21-year-old Stephen from Buckinghamshire was chosen as the guy. Although as this project is not what it seems, he's told that he's failed the audition. Stephen is a self-described lazy, irresponsible layabout. He doesn't appreciate anything he has and has no drive to do anything with his life. Okay, sure. That could probably describe a lot of people watching this video right now. Seems fairly normal so far, right? Well, here's where things start to get a little bit stupid. Darren needs to observe Stephen going about his day-to-day -day life. So what better way to do that than to install 19 hidden cameras all around both the inside and outside of his house. Camera in a shoebox, camera in the kitchen, camera in a cupboard, fucking everywhere. He also lives with his brother, mum and dad, so they've all agreed upon being under constant 24-7 surveillance in their own house. Everywhere in their house. Now, I'm sure I don't need to go into great detail about the things that a 20-something-year-old guy might be getting up to in his bedroom, but that'd all be getting filmed voyeur style while Darren smells menacingly. There are two ways to look at this, really. There's the, this is obviously completely scripted bullshit approach, which would be wondering how the fuck this could even be logistically possible. These 19 cameras are being watched in real time, so they are both recording video and sending it elsewhere at the same time. But the cameras themselves are tiny. How much battery do they have? I mean, they're recording 24-7, so you guess they'd be plugged into the mains, right? Do this family have the spare plug sockets to plug 19 cameras in? Would it not be immediately obvious to Steven? Also, what happens if he were to stumble across one of these cameras? I mean, with 19 cameras in a fairly small house, I don't imagine it would be too hard to run into one accidentally. But if you decided to believe that all that was possible to explain, and you think this is all real, then there's still some issues. What would the legality of recording this man without him knowing be? You could say that he must have signed some contract or something when he initially applied to be on a show, but I don't imagine that would say, you give us permission to constantly film you and stalk you 24-7. For some reason, they had this filter and graphic over some of the voyeur footage, I guess to make it look more real, because everyone knows nothing makes a video look more genuine than it being covered in totally real graphics. That's where all the found footage movies have the big red recording text in the corner. That's the hallmark of quality. But wait, hang on. Date, 6 7 12. The 6th of July, 2012. Yet right before this clip cuts in, the text says it's the 13th of July. Whatever. In more of the spy footage, we see the camera even moves. This is not done in post. The actual camera that's recording is moving. How would he not notice this? Also, what the fuck is this camera even mounted on? Is it on the ceiling? How would that even be obscured? It's incredibly high up for it to be on anything else. 
They also secretly record him at a pub and get one of his friends to film him at a nightclub on a night out. Because if there's one person you trust to keep this incredibly complex and resource intense plan secret, it's a drunk guy in a nightclub. But let's get back to Darren, who arrives at Steven's house while he's at work and has a bit of a snoop around his room. It looks like the stereotypical male slob's room to such a degree that it could almost seem comically fake. An empty beer cans, a typical lad message from his mate Smithy. Could that be any more generic? And how convenient. Amongst his wrestling figures and Limp Bizkit merchandise, Darren just happens to find a perfectly mint condition copy of a book about mind magic. Hmm. But now we're really getting started. It's time for stage one, information control. Darren wants to do some shit to Steven's phone, and in lieu of any better way to do it, they get his brother to just sneak in at night. Imagine if Steven had woken up to this happening, his brother tiptoeing into his room with a camera rolling. That would be an entirely different kind of video. It was pretty intense trying to sneak into someone's bedroom in the middle of the night. In comes Ben, the hacker man. He's going to supposedly hack Steven's phone. I'm pretty sure this is not legal. And even if it was in a hidden line in a contract somewhere, would that even hold up in court? I don't think so. But I don't know, lol. His phone is now mirrored to the laptop so they can watch whatever he's doing and then edit what he's seeing. He's got a banking app there. What happens if he went on that? Wouldn't that be a huge privacy breach? What if he started searching for some, uh, stuff? As I can type in sex fetish, yeah? Who knows? They can even add their own fake news to the BBC News app. Oh yeah, and despite making this huge deal about doing this his phone, they claim to have also, ahem, <clears throat> hacked his computer, as well as his entire family's phones too, yet they don't show any of that. I'd for one like to see how they hacked his computer, but maybe it was a two-man job. I'm trying, it's moving too fast. Oh, this is not good. Darren's going to plant information about a supposed meteor shower that's happening near Earth. That's going to be our apocalypse event. Darren gets some XFM radio DJs, unfortunately not Carl Pilkington, to make a fake story about the end of world prophecies. The end of the world is nigh. And... Nope, I guess that's the entirety of stage two. So let's ask a few more questions. So they listened to that fake story on what Stephen thought was a live radio broadcast. But how did they get that to play out? Were they listening to a CD of the show that just happened to have bits inserted in it? How would that be possible, seeing as it's a live radio show and thus the rest of the show would not have happened yet? Did they pre-record an entire fake radio show with just that bit in it? How would that work out, seeing as this probably had news in it? Isn't it convenient that Steven just happened to be listening at the exact same time that the segment came on? Everything's going so well for Darren that you'd almost say it was scripted. Almost. They get some TV astronomer to make some fake TV segments about the meteor shower, who claims that this shower is hiding a deadly meteor shower that could potentially wipe out the entire Earth. There are any virus issues? Some scientists think that um, there are bacteria living on some of these pieces of rock. And that information is being shared on a frothy midday TV program instead of, you know, the news. Probably because it costs a lot less to get Channel 4 cooking shows to make a fake story for you than to get the news to do it. Ain't that right, Darren? You're ending the world, but on a budget. But we need some more credible stories than that. Time to push out some fake news. Including on their NASA website, which Stephen, the stereotypically moronic slob, inexplicably is an avid reader of. How very convenient. The fake radio stories are now saying that the meteor shower is affecting the magnetism of the Earth. Aviation authorities won't be able to contact planes if it keeps on, grounding all planes in the country. That seems like a pretty big deal to me. I imagine that if that were to be the case, it would probably be being spoken about in every single news medium, not just the radio station that's on in some random cafe. Plus, the meteor is interfering with their TV. Spooky. Oh, no. And Stephen's phone. Spooky. Oh, oh fucking hell. Come again. And his van. For some reason. Um, spooky, I guess. I heard about the uh, the Perseids meteor show. That was yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's all connected. Yeah. But now it's the 31st of August, 2012, the day the world ends. It's also the day before Stephen's birthday, which ties us into the next point. Now Darren needs to end the world somehow, 
but it can't happen in a populated area or in a town or anywhere that Stephen would actually realistically be because that would cost too much and be too difficult to execute. So let's have a little quiz. I'll give you a few seconds to think of a way to get Stephen to a secluded area to end the world. Okay, time's up. The correct answer was that you get his brother to say that he got them tickets to see the killers live at a private show in a secret location in the middle of the countryside that requires them to get a special bus from a random car park to travel in. If your answer was anything other than this, it probably made too much sense to be in a Darren Brown show. Darren's on the bus too. And everyone else on the bus is an actor, (coughs) including Stephen. So let's kill him. And oh no, the magnetic meteor beams have caused the bus to break down in a secluded location away from the main road. Let's turn the radio on while we wait for it to be fixed. The meteor, Swift A, is predicted to collide with the British Isles imminently. Oh fuck. Of all the places in the world that this could be hitting, it happens to be the British Isles, and specifically the exact location around where Stephen is. I cannot adequately describe what happens next. It is so breathtakingly fucking awful. Here we have the meteors that could destroy the entire world colliding with Earth. The entire world. I understand that this is mostly supposed to be for show, as we, the audience, know that the meteors aren't real. But come on, if you were in Steven's place, would you really believe that these meteors are destroying the entire world? They barely even make an impact on this small field. Most of this shit is clearly CG anyway, like it's painfully obvious, so it would be even worse looking in person. Also, they mute all the audio for this first part because they realise how fucking bad it would sound. The meteors hit both sides of the bus and they have no impact at all, and Steven doesn't even look that scared. But here comes Darren, what's he gonna- That man's trying to read! Just looking forward to getting changed and into bed. You can come and get into bed. You're a little bit different from your bed at home. We'll wake you up. <laughs> 